Welcome back to History for Today. This is the final segment of my first chapter of U.S. History 2. And in this one I want to look at three important politicians. Two of the most famous politicians of the day were a populist who remained within the Democratic Party, William Jennings Bryan, and a socialist, Eugene V. Debs. Bryan, who lived from 1860 to 1925, was a famous orator, a Nebraska congressman, a three-time presidential candidate, and the U.S. Secretary of State under Woodrow Wilson. Then, at the end of his life, he was the lawyer who supported prohibition and opposed Darwinism in the 1925 Scopes Monkey Trial, which didn't turn out well for him. Although Bryan was unsuccessful at winning the presidency, he forever altered the course of American political history. When the Long Depression worsened in the Midwest in the late 1880s, struggling farmers faced low crop prices and found few politicians on their side. Many rallied to the populist cause, but Bryan worked from within the Democratic Party, winning election to the Nebraska House of Representatives, where he served for two terms. In 1895, Bryan launched a national speaking tour to promote the free coinage of silver. He believed that bimetallism, as it was called, by inflating American currency, could alleviate the farmers' debts. In contrast, the Republicans were championing the gold standard and a flat money supply. The Democratic Party's 1896 National Convention nominated Bryan for president on a platform asserting that the gold standard was not only un-American, but anti-American. Bryan spoke last at the convention, declaring, we shall answer their demands for a gold standard by saying to them, you shall not press down upon the brow of labor this crown of thorns. You shall not crucify mankind upon a cross of gold. After a few seconds of stunned silence, the convention went wild. The Republicans ran William McKinley, an economic conservative who had written the Tariff Act of 1890 and who championed business interests and the gold standard. Bryan crisscrossed the country, spreading the silver gospel. McKinley pretty much stayed home. The election drew enormous attention and a lot of emotion. The pro-business Republicans outspent Bryan's campaign five to one. And a notably high 79.3% of eligible American voters cast ballots in this election. Turnout averaged 90% in areas that supported Bryan, but the Republicans won the population dense Northeast and the Great Lakes region and also California. McKinley, of course, won. And in early 1900, Congress passed the Gold Standard Act, which effectively ended the debate over the nation's monetary policy. Bryan ran again in 1900 and in 1908 without success. McKinley signed the Dingley Tariff in 1897, which, as I mentioned, raised duties on foreign products to their highest level in American history. And then after beating Bryan again in 1900, McKinley was assassinated in 1901 by Leon Solgos, an unemployed anarchist steelworker. Bryan was among the most influential losers in American political history. When the agrarian wing of the Democratic Party nominated the Nebraska congressman in 1896, Bryan's condemnation of Northeastern financial interest and his calls for free and unlimited coinage of silver co-opted some of the most popular populist issues. The Democrats were able to siphon off a large portion of the populists' political support, but they were still unable to beat McKinley. Populist energy moved from the radical but still weak People's Party to the more moderate but more powerful Democratic Party. But that energy was less than it could have been because many radicals refused to move toward the center. Although at first glance, the populist movement seems to have been a failure, the agrarian revolt established the roots of later reforms and nearly all of the policies outlined in the Omaha platform would eventually be put into law over the next few decades under the management of middle-class centrist reformers. In large measure, 
the populist vision laid the intellectual groundwork for the coming progressive movement. Some American socialists carried on the populist radical tradition by uniting farmers and workers in a sustained decades-long political struggle to reorder American economic life. Socialists argued that wealth and power were in the hands of too few individuals, that monopolies and trusts control too much of the economy, and that owners and investors were growing rich while workers who produced their wealth were suffering from low pay, long hours, and unsafe working conditions. The early 19th century political philosopher Pierre-Joseph Proudhon had declared, what is property? It is robbery. Later 19th century philosopher Karl Marx had described the new industrial economy as a worldwide class struggle between the wealthy bourgeoisie who owned the means of production such as factories and farms and the proletariat, factory workers and tenant farmers who worked only for the wealth of others. Marx and many of his followers believed that all the value in the economy was derived from labor. This was clearly not accurate unless the term labor was given a definition wide enough to include the intellectual work that went into designing new technologies, implementing them in factories, and then managing the new production processes. But Marx's idea did focus attention on the fact that much wealth was the product of past labor and a lot of wealth accrued to people who didn't do the work, rather than to those who did. Ownership of capital assets, which Marx called the means of production, seemed to be a key feature in hanging on to the profits, and workers believed that that was unjust. Eugene V. Debs, who lived from 1855 to 1926, was a trade unionist, an Indiana state senator, and a Socialist Party for candidate five times the final time in 1920 while he was in prison. According to Debs, the socialists sought what he called the overthrow of the capitalist system and the emancipation of the working class from wage slavery. Under an imagined socialist cooperative commonwealth, many of the means of production would be owned collectively, ensuring that all men and women would receive a fair wage for their labor. According to socialist organizer and newspaper editor Oscar Ameringer, socialists wanted ownership of the trust by the government and the ownership of the government by the people. Public ownership leagues attracted members from all walks of life, who wanted to shift control of services like city gas works and later electrical utilities to the public. Other activists looked at European nations like Switzerland, which had nationalized its railway system in 1901 after a nationwide referendum vote. And they wondered why American railroads, which had been built with so much federal assistance, should remain in private hands. The idea that municipal services should be owned by local governments and that natural monopolies such as railroads should be nationalized began to gain wide support. The socialist movement drew from a very diverse constituency. Party membership was open to everybody, regardless of race, gender, class, ethnicity, or religion. Many prominent Americans, such as Helen Keller, the novelist Upton Sinclair, reformer Jane Addams, and the novelist Jack London, became socialists. They were joined by masses of American laborers from across the United States. Factory workers, miners, railroad builders, tenant farmers, and small farmers, all united under this red flag of socialism. Many supported Debs, socialist labor party leader Daniel de Leon, and the mining union leader William D. Big Bill Hayward when they joined together in 1905 to form the Industrial Workers of the World, the IWW. The Wobblies, as they became known, became a radical and very confrontational union that welcomed all workers, regardless of race or gender. Others turned to politics as well. The Socialist Party of America, the SPA, founded in 1901, carried on the American third party political tradition of the populists. Socialist mayors were elected in 33 cities and towns, from Berkeley, California, to Schenectady, New York and two socialists from Wisconsin and New York won congressional seats. All told, over a thousand socialist candidates won American political offices. Julius Wayland, editor of the socialist newspaper Appeal to Reason, said, 
Socialism is coming. It's coming like a prairie fire and nothing can stop it. You can feel it in the air. By 1913, there were 150,000 members of the Socialist Party. And in his fourth run for president in 1912, Eugene V. Debs received almost a million votes, or 6% of the total. Socialism, as we'll see, unfortunately ran afoul of international events. Like many activists, including Helen Keller, Robert La Follette, and Jane Addams, Debs spoke out against World War I. President Woodrow Wilson declared Debs a traitor to his country, and after a speech in Canton, Ohio, in which he urged resistance to the draft, Debs was arrested on 10 counts of sedition and sentenced to 10 years in prison. At his sentencing hearing, Debs said, Your Honor, years ago I recognized my kinship with all living beings, and I made up my mind that I was not one bit better than the meanest on earth. I said then, and I say now, that while there is a lower class, I am in it. And while there is a criminal element, I am of it. And while there is a soul in prison, I am not free. Debs ran for president again while in prison and received, once again, nearly a million votes. At the end of 1921, the actual winner of that presidential election, Warren G. Harding, commuted Debs' sentence to time served, and he was freed. We'll return to resistance to World War I in a later chapter, but that is all for now. So I'll ask you a couple of parting questions. Why did William Jennings Bryan become such a powerful force in American politics, and how did the fact that he was a Democrat rather than a populist affect American politics? How did the Republicans such as McKinley defeat advocates of public ownership? And finally, why was Eugene V. Debs never elected president? So that has been chapter one of my U.S. History 2 text. I hope you found that interesting. Thanks for listening. I'll see you next time.